Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya, Chapter 12, What Happens After. The November 1917 revolution was the first historical instance where the workers not only gained power, but held it. In contrast to the Paris Commune, which was bloodily put down after but two short months of existence, the new worker state called the dictatorship of the proletariat or the Soviet state survived the protracted civil wars launched against it by national and international capitalism. It left a ruined country facing starvation, but there was no doubt at all that the dictatorship of the proletariat was there to stay. The two biggest tasks it faced theoretically were one, how would labor assert its mastery over the economy and the state? And two, since the dictatorship is supposed to be a transitional state, transitional to socialism, how would it achieve its own withering way? On these, on these hinged the long range aim of establishing a truly classless society where the free and full development of each individual was the condition of development of all, and thus, once and for all, to end what Marx considered the prehistory of man. The reintegration of man's manual and mental abilities in the producer himself would first open the real history of humanity. As Lenin put it, the overthrow of the exploiter class is the easiest part of the social revolution. Now comes the prosaic, daily, hard, and more important work of abolishing the distinction between manual workers and brain workers. The difficulty is that workers are shy and do not know all the organizing talent in them, while the intellectuals are full of conceit and yet are lack lackadaisical. This lackadaisicalness, carelessness, slovenliness, untidiness, nervous haste, the inclination to substitute discussion for action, talk for work, the inclination to undertake everything under the sun without finishing anything is one of the characteristics of the educated, and this is not due to the fact that they are bad by nature. Still less is it due to malice. Is it due to their habits of life, the conditions of their work, to fatigue, to the abnormal separation of mental from manual labor, and so on and so forth. The workers and peasants are still shy. They must get rid of this shyness, and they certainly will get rid of it. It is not the gods who make pots. This is the motto that the workers and the, go and the peasants should get well drilled into their minds. They must understand that the whole thing now is practice, that the historical moment has arrived when theory is being transformed into practice, is vitalized by practice, corrected by practice, tested by practice. The Paris Commune gave a great example of how to combine initiative, independence, freedom of action, and vigor from below with voluntary centralism free from stereotyped forms. Our Soviets are following the example, but they are still shy. There's a great deal of this talent among the people. It is merely suppressed. It must be given an opportunity to display itself. It and it alone, with the support of the masses, can save Russia and the cause of socialism. The point was that the Communist Party, now that it was in power, was not eliciting this talent. On the contrary, it was displaying a passion for bossing. The main enemy was the bureaucracy which was springing up. It is true the workers on their own moved quickly from control of production to the spontaneous seizure of the factories. It is true the peasants took the land. It is true the Soviets were now organs of state power. It is true the new Soviet state's declaration of the rights of toilers and the new program of the newly formed, or more correctly, newly named communist Bolshevik party incorporated as theory and practice the principle that eventually the population to a man should manage production in the state. It is no less true that the protracted civil war right on the heels of the world war and the two revolutions left Russia a ruined economy and a devastated land. The trade unions were so young in this country where 
autocratic Tsarism had so recently been overthrown that their first national convention was held only after the revolution. They voted to participate most energetically in all the administrative departments of production, organized the labor boards of control, registration and distribution of labor, the exchange of labor between the village and the city, to fight against sabotage and establish complete labor cooperation and discipline. The Communist Party acknowledged them as the chief means of struggle against the bureaucratization of the economic apparatus of Soviet power that creates the possibility for the real people's control over the results of production. Yet, at the first serious crisis, immediately after the cessation of civil war, the party was shaken by a violent dispute over the role of these same trade unions in the workers' state. Though all voted for the first resolution, there were three different answers to exactly how workers should participate in the management of the economy. One, Trotsky said, statify the trade unions. Two, Shlipenkov demanded, turn the management of the entire economy over to the trade unions. Instead of statifying the trade unions, trade unionize the state. Three, Lenin said, while drawing the unions into management of the state, you must at the same time see that they are schools of communism. Since this is not only the most famous debate during Lenin's lifetime, which tested the relations of party to mass in life, but also anticipated the problem of today, we would go into all the facts. One, the famous trade union dispute of 1920 to 21, the positions of Lenin, Trotsky, and Shlip Shlipnikov. In the ruined conditions of Russia, railroad transportation was in utter chaos. It goes without saying that no modern country can exist without transportation. And here, at the birth of a new society, the railroads weren't running and the whole transportation system was still plagued with sabotage from the defeated counter-revolutionary forces. Something drastic had to be done. A central executive committee of transportation was established called Kektrin. It was a merger of the railroad workers and the water transport worker, workers unions, and a non-union man was put at the head of it, Leon Trotsky, Commissar of War. He and his committee were granted extraordinary military powers in order to cope with the, dis the disastrous situation. Within a year, not only were the railroads running again and on time, but the railroad trackage had been much expanded. The country was beginning to breathe again. It was then that the Water Workers Union spoke up. They said that they had fully approved the granting of extraordinary military powers needed to restore transportations. But now that the job was done, they demanded our normal trade union de democracy be given back to us. Trotsky reacted violently. He said it wasn't the special commission that had to be abolished. It was the trade union leaders that had to be shaken up. That is how the famous trade union debate began. Before it ended, subjects in dispute ranged far and wide. One, what is a worker's state? Two, what is the role of trade unions in such a state? Three, what is the relationship between workers at the point of production and the political party in power? Four, what is the, the relationship between leaders and ranks, party and mass? The uniqueness of the 1920 debate is that in the three leading positions are contained embryonically the problem we face today as to the relationship among the three major social formations, trade unionists, politicos, masses. What in 1920 was an almost doctrinaire debate among communist leaders is in 1957 an almost daily problem we face in any strike. Lenin rose to the defense of the trade unions. Taken as a whole, he said, Trotsky's policy is one of the bureaucratic bureaucratically nagging the trade unions. There is valuable military experience, heroism, zeal, etc. There is the bad experience of the worst elements of the military, bureaucracy and conceit. Had Trotsky looked at the reality of the transition, Lenin insisted, and not been carried away by intellectual talk or abstract arguments, 
he would have seen the Soviet Union was not a pure worker state, but a state in which, first, the peasantry predominated, and secondly, it was bureaucratically distorted. Our present state is such, continued Lenin realistically, that the entirely organized proletariat must protect itself and must utilize the workers' organization for the purpose of protecting the workers from their own state and in order that the workers may protect our state. When has anyone ever made a more profound and more devastating attack on the Russian workers' state than to say that the workers as workers must protect themselves from the workers as state? Trotsky, on the other hand, contended that since Soviet Russia was a worker state, the workers had nothing to fear from it, and hence the trade unions could be incorporated into the state, and labor could be militarized. He argued for the establishment of such a regime under which each worker feels himself to be a soldier of labor who cannot freely dispose of himself. If he is ordered, if he is ordered transferred, he must execute that order. If he does not do so, he will be a deserter who should be punished. Who will execute this? The trade union. It will create a new regime that is the militarization of the working class. Trotsky's callousness. Callousness. <laughs> Trotsky's callousness to the dissatisfaction of the workers with itself or with the functioning of his special commission, the Kektrin, showed itself especially clearly in the attention he concentrated upon the trade union leadership, who, he said, must be shaken up. According to him, it was not the extraordinary political commission with its extraordinary military powers that was at the root of the crisis. Rather, it was the trade union leadership which had failed to create a proper production atmosphere. Shlepnikov, the head of the workers' opposition, opposed both Lenin and Trotsky. He too began and ended with the abstraction of a worker state. Since that was already established, he asked, what is the necessity for political leadership to hold primacy? It was as if all problems had faded away with the conquest of political power. To him, it was a simple matter. All that was needed in the chaotic conditions of 1920 was to turn over industry to the corresponding trade unions. Although he was a Bolshevik leader, he could not see he could not see the role of the communist party once there was a worker state he called for the con convocation of a producers congress the organization of the management of the national economy is the function of the all russian congress of producers organized in industrial unions which elects bodies to manage the whole of the national economy of the republic lenin was the supreme realist he asked both Trotsky and Shlep Shlepnikov what was the use of talking about a worker state when the concrete reality of the specific Russian Soviet state disclosed that the dictatorship of the proletariat existed oh no existed in a country where the workers were a tiny minority surrounded by a sea of peasants to talk to to talk of a producer's congress, a term used by Marx and Engels for a classless society in the specific circumstances where the defeated counter-revolution was looking for ways and means to get back into power was to play right into its hands. At this moment in our history, Lenin turned sharply to Shlepnikov. You and your workers' opposition are the greatest danger to our continued existence. Just look at your position. Look at the Kronstadt mutiny and see how quickly the white guards have grabbed on to the anarchistic, syndicalist talk of freedom from political leadership and with guns in their hands are threatening the new worker state. Under, under these actual conditions for you to propose a producer's congress means for you to ask the worker state to commit suicide. Lenin then turned to Trotsky and told him he must never forget that Soviet Russia was a worker state with bureaucratic distortions. Every other word on Lenin's lips those days was bureaucracy. Any attempt to plan that did not involve the masses themselves was nothing but bureaucratic project hatching. 
anyone who desired to shake up the trade union leadership. Who desired to shake up the trade union leadership displayed a bureaucratic concentration on the leading strata. In fact, any political tendency that did not concentrate the whole weight of the argument on the question of working out a new relationship to the masses betrayed bureaucratic tendencies. The whole point, Lenin was most persistent in this, is the method of approach to be adopted toward the masses, the method of winning the masses, of contact with the masses. When Trotsky pontific pontificated workers' democracies Workers' democracy knows no fetishism and knows only revolutionary expediency. Lenin replied uncompromisingly that the workers are right when they say, we, the ordinary rank and file, the masses, say that we must renovate, we must correct, we must expel the bureaucrats. But you pitch us a yarn about engaging in production. I do not want to engage in production with such and such a bureaucratic board of directors, chief committee, etc., but with another kind. Marxists have always been acutely aware of the fact that a theoretical position is not accidental. That is why Lenin tried to correct Trotsky. We must not fear to admit the disease, the disease of bureaucratism, Lenin warned, lest we ourselves develop an administrative mentality. When you come down to rock bottom, there is one way, only one way to arrive at new social relations forever, new millions for every forever new millions of toilers, and that is gradually to draw the whole toiling population to a man in the work of running the state. That is not easy, and there are many cogwheels and transmission belts from the masses to the vanguard. That is precisely why the vanguard cannot turn the trade unions into organs of force, statify them, but must rather make of them schools of communism. Where Trotsky contended, we suffer not so much from the bat bad sides of bureaucracy, as chiefly from the fact that we have not assimilated the many good sides. Lenin insisted that the only correct position was that of the trade union thesis itself. Introduction of genuine labor discipline is conceived only if the whole mass of participants in production take a conscious part in the fulfillment of these tasks. This cannot be achieved by bureau bureaucratic methods and orders from above. This was a leadership divided against itself on the very basic ground of its relationship to the masses. Objective forces were already pulling in a direction away from the full development of the workers themselves. Where Lenin said that what was new, what was shocking, was to discover a passion for bossing among the communists. Now that they had power, Trotsky was shadowboxing with the old trade union concepts, and Shlipnikov was flirting with the anarchistic freedom from political leadership. Where Lenin put the worker's attitude in the center of all this thought, of all his thoughts, Trotsky put the administrative solution. Trotsky refused to recognize the administrator as the new enemy. Quite the contrary. He accused Lenin of approaching very practical questions too much from the propagandist point of view, and forgetting that here we not only have material for agitation, but a problem which must be solved administratively. Lenin, on the other hand, stated loudly and clearly that the bureaucracy was the new enemy and that Trotsky's administrative approach made him weakest, where he should have been strongest, as a propagandist. What was wrong with his thesis, Lenin main maintained, was that through it, there runs like a red thread the administrative approach. History knows all sorts of degenerations, Lenin kept hammering away to depend upon conviction, devotion, and other spiritual qualities in politics, that is not at all a serious thing. 2. Lenin and his new concept, party work to be checked by non-party masses. Lenin's enemies are a legion nowadays. There is always a lot of talk about his having been a Democrat, and an exponent of workers' management from below, only in theory, but that as soon as state and revolution was put away as a book, the practice of governing made him a dictator. 
Attempts have been made to give the impression that the young workers' state forbade strikes. If it did, it surely failed to enforce the edict. In the year of the trade union debate, Tomsky, the head of the trade unions, reported that there were, in Moscow alone, between 30 and 40 strikes a month. Naturally, the party thought the trade unions ought to function so well that workers' grievances are acted upon as they arise, and not let dis dissatisfactions accumulate and cause walkouts. But not only were strikes permitted, Tomsky and other communist leaders were complaining that communists were losing influence because some were stupid enough not to walk out when the workers in their shops went on strike. Tomsky severely rebuked the Shinovnik petty bureaucrat attitude underlying the proposals that strikes be allowed only in privately owned plants and not in state enterprises. Lenin's insistence on trade unions as schools of communism was not to enforce discipline, which he insisted only the workers themselves can enforce, but to stress that production problems can be solved for the workers if the transitional state was to be transitional to socialism and not to a return backwards to capitalism. One of the conclusive proofs of Lenin's dictatorship cited by his enemies is that it was he who introduced the resolution on party unity which forbade factions. It is true that at the 10th Congress, when the economy lay in ruins and the Kronstadt mutiny threatened the very existence of the new state and forced to return backward to, to limited capitalism, the new economic policy, Lenin asked that all differing positions within the Communist Party be expressed to the party directly rather than through caucuses. But, one, this was done after the discussion was over, after delegates had been elected on the differing platforms, and after the, after the duly convoked Congress had come to majority decisions and voted. Two, Shlipnikov, against whom the resolution was aimed, was not only not removed from his post, but representatives of his position were taken into the Central Committee. Three, the platform of the workers' opposition had appeared in the central organ of the party in no fewer than 250,000 copies. And four, even after the elimination of caucuses, a discussion sheet was established so that opposing views could continue to be expressed. The Kronstadt mutiny compelled sharp measures, which are certainly no model for a worker's state to follow. But to draw a parallel between Lenin's resolution and Stalin's monolithism is to fly in the face of the facts as well as of theory, and to make a complete hash of historic periods. The truth is, precision such as Lenin's in the 1920 debate can, only, can come only from a man who lives by his theory, or more precisely, by the vision of the future society. To put it dialectically, Lenin had a clear notion in his head. It was the new absolute to a man, and he judged the truth of reality by its relationship to the truth of the notion. The toiling population to a man, to a man, that is to say every single man, woman, and youth, from cook to bottle washer, from machinist to handyman, from intellectual to washerwoman, especially the unskilled laborers who are living under ordinary, i.e. very hard conditions. Emphasis is Len oh. Lenin was most insistent in his writings in those early years that just as Marx and Capital counterposed the workers' struggle for the shortening of the working day to all the grand grandiloquent and empty phrases of the Declaration of Rights, so must they now in Russia have fewer pompous phrases, more plain everyday work, concern for the good of grain and the, and the pood of coal, Genuine communism, he wrote, differs from phrasemongering in that it reduces everything to the conditions of labor. This thing, <clears throat> this total conception that only the masses from below to a man can create a new way of life for millions, he elaborated in State and Revolution as theory. It was the guiding line in his everyday practical work. The tragedy of the Russian Revolution is that this was not achieved. Even with a correct approach to the masses, 
as exemplified in the trade union resolution incorporating Lenin's views, the young worker state could not lift itself by its own boots, bootstraps, particularly as it didn't have any boots. A retreat to the NEP, the new economic policy which permitted operation of certain capitalist enterprises, <coughs> had to be undertaken. None of the Bolshevik leaders thought they could hold out for long in isolated backward Russia without the aid of the European Revolution. In explaining the policy of the NEP to the Third Congress of the Communist International, Lenin stressed their dependence on the International Revolution. We quite openly admit we do not conceal the fact that concessions in the system of state capitalism mean paying tribute to capitalism. But we gain time and gaining time means gaining everything particularly in the epoch of equilibrium when our foreign comrades are preparing thoroughly for their revolution. <coughs> With the defeat of the German Revolution of 1923, after the beheading of the German Revolution of 1919, the proletarian revolution in Russia was completely isolated. Lenin, who made no fetish of the worker state, watched like a hawk the further developments of the NEP and of his party. He knew very well that the, that the dictatorship of the proletariat was a transitional state, which could be transitional either to socialism or to a return backward to capitalism. Depending upon the historic initiative of the masses and the international situation, he knew that the party, especially now that it had power, was not immune to the, to the circumstances under which it operated. The whole 1920-21 to 21 debate showed that the same great formations in society, trade unionists, politicos, masses, were reflected in the leadership of the party. He depended on the ranks, who were closest to the masses outside, to set the party straight. Party work must be checked by the non-party masses, he wrote. Of course, we should not submit to, su submit to everything the masses say. For the masses also yield to sentiments that are not in the least advanced, particularly in years of exceptional weariness and exhaustion resulting from excessive burdens and suffering. But in appraising persons, in determining our attitudes to those who have become com commissarized, bureaucratized, the suggestions of non-party proletarian masses, and in many cases of the non-party peasant masses, are extremely valuable. The toiling masses have a fine instinct for the difference between honest and devoted communists and those who arouse revulsion of feeling in one who obtains his bread by the sweat of his brow, who enjoys no privileges, and who has no open door to the chief. This party man, in his last appearance before the Communist Party Congress, spoke about how mortally sick, mortally sick he was of, com of communities? communist lies. This communist leader invented words to express his severe criticism of the young workers' state and of the party that led the revolution. Precisely because he stood on the great achievements of this revolution, his criticism was more devastating than that of any of its enemies. History proceeds in devious ways, he kept warning. Making no fetishism out of the workers' state, he spoke of the simple class truth of the class enemy, who say that the Soviet state has taken the road that will lead to the ordinary bourgeois state. It is very useful to read this sort of thing, which is written not because the communist state allows you to write some things and does not allow you to write others, but because it really is the class truth, bluntly and frankly uttered by the class enemy. What he warned about, in a word, is of the inevitable coming of state capitalism, if the bureaucratization and isolation of the Soviet state continued. If we take that huge bureaucratic machine, that huge pile, we must ask, who is leading whom? I doubt very much whether it could be said that the communists were guiding this pile. To tell the truth, it is not they who are leading, they are being led. Just as he made no fetishism of the workers' state, Neither did he of the Bolshevik party, which he founded. We have followed the development of his views on that since 1902, and especially the period of 1917, when he told his party that if they would not put the question of workers' power on the agenda, 
he would go to the sailors. He at all times not only said so, but acted on the principle that in revolutionary situations, the masses are far in advance of the party, and the party ranks far in advance of the party leadership. Of course, that did not mean that he did not assign a very fundamental role to the party he founded, but it was in strict relationship to the actual spontaneous movement of the masses. Outside of that relationship, the party would become anything its worst enemy could think of. It did. 3. Lenin's Will There is no greater indictment of the party leadership that led the only successful revolution in history than Lenin's Will. In it, he was concerned with his own colleagues, leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in November 1917, who had themselves given birth to a new bureaucracy. There is no more amazing document in the annals of politics than this brief two-page will. It deals in the concrete with the leaders of the Russian Communist Party in a manner which leaves no division between politics and economics, history and philosophy, theory and practice, revolution and counter-revolution. Lenin states boldly that, if the dual nature of the Russian state, that of being a state of workers and peasants, is at the root of the dispute between the principal combatants, Trotsky and Stalin, then no force on earth could stop the class division from bringing down the workers' state. Its fall is inevitable. However, the trends implicit in the dispute are not yet a reality. With that in mind, says Lenin, let's take a look at the general staff which made the revolution. 1. Stalin. He is rude and disloyal. He must be removed. 2. Trotsky. His non-Bolshevism, writes Lenin, does not in any way detract from the fact that he is the most able man in the present Central Committee, but he is far too much attracted by the purely administrative side of affairs. <clears throat> 3. Zinoviev and Kamenev. They publicized the date of revolution in the capitalist press at the very moment when the workers were trying to take power. This was no accident, Lenin reminds us. That is to say, at every critical moment, they can be expected to do the same. What stands out in the rest of the will is that it was not alone the older men who would look for administrative instead of human solutions to complex problems but the younger men. Take Bukharin. 4. Bukharin is not only the most valuable and biggest theoretician of the party, but also may legitimately be considered the favorite of the whole party. But his theoretical views can only, with the very greatest doubt, be regarded as fully, Mar fully Marxian, for there is something scholastic in him. He never learned, and I think never fully understood, the dialectic. <clears throat> Lenin once said that the one word which could characterize the whole of the Marx-Engels correspondence was dialectics. This is no less true of Lenin in the period since his philosophic notebooks. This, again, is the central feature of all of Lenin's disputes with Bukharin, beginning with the national question during World War I and ending with the will. That was so not only in his public debates, but in his commentary on Bukharin's theoretical works, which Lenin did not publicly criticize. We have Lenin's notebooks of 1920, in which he commented on Bukharin's economics of the transition period. The book puts forward the theory of an allegedly classless force, a third group. Neither capitalist nor worker, that is, which Bukharin calls the technical intelligentsia, whose mission it seems to be to establish economic equilibrium. According to Bukharin, the technical intelligentsia was born to replace the blind laws of the market. The development was industrial to finance capital was a development from an unorganized anarchic commodity economy to an organized planned economy. The organizing force of that is the technical intelligentsia. This is the new absolute for state capitalism and for the, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the transition period. No wonder Bukharin found himself alongside Trotsky in the trade union debate. As Lenin put it in his remarks on Bukharin's economics of the transition period, when he reached a passage where Bukharin finally remembered the two fundamental laws of where 
of capitalist production, centralization of capital and socialization of labor. Finally, thank God, human language instead of organized babbling. All is well that ends well. But two pages later, he is hitting out against Bukharin again. He quotes Bu Bukharin. Once the destruction of capitalist production relations is really given, and once the theoretic impossibility of the restoration is proven. Then Lenin comments, impossibility is demonstrated only practically. The author does not pose dialectically the relationship of theory to practice. Now, in his will, Lenin is summing up his analysis of Bukharin, the theoretician. And again, the criticism is all concentrated in the word dialectic. It is evident that, to Lenin, one cannot be regarded as a Marxist, though one is the biggest theoretician of the party, if one has never fully understood the dialectic. Far from making the will a new point of departure, the whole leadership of the Bolshevik party agreed not to publish the founder's will. After Trotsky was exiled, he published it. His commentary does not shed much illumination on it, because Trotsky was closest to Lenin in that year, he tried to play down the seriousness of the 1920-21 debate, although it is clear Lenin had that debate in mind when he spoke of Trotsky's administrative attitude. Far from admitting his error, Trotsky insisted in all his later writings um, that the mistake was not in the demand for statification, but the fact that the economic policy did not correspond to the economic conditions. He maintained that it was the economic conditions which made him propose free trade a year before the NEP, and when the political bureau rejected his proposal, then he proposed statification of the union, and in the end, Lenin and he agreed. The truth, however, is that though all did vote for the NEP, Trotsky did so administratively once again, and therefore, he spoke of the concrete conditions which now excluded the possibility of practical inclusion of trade unionists in the management of the economy. It was not the economic conditions, neither in 1920 nor in 1921 nor in 1923, that made Trotsky write as he did. It was his attitude to the broad masses, whether his program was for free trade or for the single plan. His attitude to the masses was the same. The proof is in his theories after he was expelled from Russia and his arch enemy Stalin put into operation the five-year plan which moved to its own gory conclusion in 1932. Trotsky still spoke the same language. The role of factory committees remain important, of course, but in the sphere of management of industry, it has no longer a leading but an auxiliary, auxiliary position. If Trotsky did not mean what he wrote, his great revolutionary wrote for two decades without finding the words to express what he did mean. Yet he always found words, thousands and thousands of words, to express the opposite of what he did mean. It is impossible to arrive at any other conclusion than the fact that even Lenin's closest colleagues, and then was closer than Trotsky in that last period when Lenin appealed to him, for a joint struggle against Stalin, had been treating Lenin's philosophic concepts as the Marxists before World War I had treated Marxian philosophy as some rhetorical adjunct to the great economic theories. Nothing could be further from the truth. Without the humanism of Marx and later of Lenin, the economic theories of both are meaningless. Leaders are not classless creatures floating between heaven and earth. They are very much earth men, when they lose close connection with the working class, they begin to represent the only other fundamental class in society, the capitalist class. What was not yet a reality when Lenin wrote this became a reality very soon when Stalin consolidated his power and introduced the plan. It is true that even Lenin did not see Stalin as representing an alien class, but he was prophetic in this. He stated that if the differences within the leadership did reflect outright class differences, then nothing could save the workers' state. Nothing did. It became transformed into a state capitalist society. As we shall see later, once a new class, that of state capitalism, emerged in Russia, not only did the Russian Communist Party become its victim, so too did the Third International. 
where Lenin, with characteristic precision, moved from the strict conditions he laid down for joining the International to an admission that the language of its resolutions was too Russian, Stalin imposed monolithism upon the Russian Communist Party and made it the Yukasi for the entire International. The totalitarian dictators who now rule Russia have, after more than a quarter of a century of silence, during which the state mentioned in the will are dead, suddenly decided to admit its existence, subordinating it to their, subordinating it to their contrived myth of the cult of personality. <coughs> Nothing could have been stranger to Lenin. The rude and disloyal, character, disloyal characterization of Stalin had nothing to do with any cult of personality. What Lenin was saying was, it is the masses and only they who can smash the old and create the new, while the leaders who made such great contributions to the success of the revolution are, as individuals, impotent to change the course of history. Worse yet, there is nothing in the philosophy and politics of the leaders that can keep the passions that stirred in their breasts from being as base and mean as those that stirred the capitalists to their mission. What was not a reality in January 1924 soon became a reality. It is not alone Stalin whom Lenin characterized. It is his progeny, the present rulers whom Stalin brought up in his own image. The one and only way for them to carry out Lenin's will is to remove themselves from power. Lenin summed up a lifetime spent in the revolutionary movement and concluded that if the party dispute reflected actual class lines, nothing on earth can close up those divisive lines. The proletarian state would collapse. So it did.